From the very beginning of our marriage, I was tormented by the nasty remarks of my mother-in-law, Jennifer, and my father-in-law, Steve. On top of that, I was continuously harassed for not having children. Emily is young and beautiful, and unlike you, she got pregnant right away. I'm really jealous of my brother. These words even came from my unreliable husband, Kenny. Moreover, Jennifer accused me of infertility because of alleged affairs. My daughter-in-law is cheating, so I caught her on hidden camera. Such outrageous claims were made, so I devised a plan and gathered all the relatives under the guise of celebrating my nephew's third birthday to play the so-called evidence of my affair that Jennifer mentioned. Just as I thought. Words slipped out of Emily, Kenny, and Steve, accompanied by expressions of despair. My name is Mary Smith, 34 years old. I work in the international division of a mid-sized trading company. I live with my husband, Kenny, who is the same age and works for a steel company, and my in-laws. We don't have any children yet. I met my husband at a community mixer I attended at the invitation of a friend. I was in my fourth year of working, just starting to find my job interesting and wasn't really thinking about marriage. But I couldn't say no to a college friend who insisted I come. So, my interest was mostly in the special menus prepared by each venue for the event quite literally preferring donuts over flowers. I felt like I was drifting away from a friend who was mingling a lot. But turns out, the guy who's been getting close to that friend was hanging out with Kenny. Apparently, Kenny wasn't too keen on the event either and had been somewhat dragged along. We ended up sticking together as two misfits, but I intended it to be just a one-time thing and deliberately didn't exchange contact information. However, Exactly one week after the event, on a Friday, I got a call on my cell from an unknown number. At first, I ignored it. But after work, the call started coming in every 10 minutes. What the heck? Getting annoyed. I was about to block the number, but decided to check who was so persistently calling me. It was Kenny, whom I had met at the event. I'm glad. You are Mary, right? It was good to know who was behind these mysterious calls, but I hadn't given Kenny my number. I got your number from the friend you came with. Kenny answered nonchalantly. It turned out that my friend, who hit it off with Kenny's buddy, decided to date him, inspired by their meeting at the event. Meanwhile, Kenny, who had missed the chance to ask for my contact, got my number from his friend after pleading with him. Despite being appalled by my friend who lightly shared my number and Kenny who exploited that, I somehow started dating Kenny. And a year later, he proposed, and we decided to get married. It wasn't a passionate love affair, but I thought I could have a peaceful life with Kenny, who was endearingly laid back. I had no issues with getting married. My parents separated when I started college, but they never officially divorced saying there was no real benefit to it at this point. Friends and acquaintances asked if I felt lonely, but I never thought much of it because my parents were essentially leading separate lives under the same roof anyway. During college, they paid my tuition, so I would visit my mom and dad's houses alternately during long breaks. But after starting my job, I mostly just updated them on social media due to work commitments. When I told them I was getting married, they said they would attend the wedding if there was one, but when I mentioned we're getting married at the courthouse, but we're not having a ceremony, they later sent me a generous cash gift as a celebration. I felt that was more than enough. However, my in-laws, Jennifer and Steve, seemed displeased with my parents' approach. Just settling their only daughter's wedding with money. They seem quite thoughtless. That's for sure makes you worry about the future. They added scornfully. Money is also a sign of love. It's weird for you, mom, who has never worked, to say such things. Dad, if you knew the value of earning money, you wouldn't say that either. Kenny defended me, making me truly glad I chose him. But four years into the marriage, 
things started to turn sour. The initial trigger was my promotion. I had worked diligently in my assigned department since joining the company and decided to take the promotion exam that year. Mary, you said at your job interview that you wanted to be globally active in the future, right? Why not gain some experience in the international division? I was thrilled to have my efforts recognized and thought Kenny would share my joy. However, when I told him, Kenny became visibly upset and started yelling. Well, I see. So, what are you trying to say? That I've made it big, and I'm all high and mighty now, huh? Taken aback by Kenny's unexpected attitude, I wondered if I had said something to offend him. Sorry, I didn't mean it like that. See, you getting all defensive like that is proof you're looking down on me, right? Kenny angrily threw his beer can into the trash and stormed out of the apartment, slamming the door behind him. He didn't come back for a week. He wouldn't read my texts or answer my calls. I even called his office out of desperation, but they said he was out, and I couldn't learn anything except that he was presumably safe. I thought about waiting for him outside his office, but that would have embarrassed Kenny too much. So, I decided to visit his parents' house to talk to them. I expected a scolding, but I had no other options. Despite the sudden visit, I was surprisingly led into the living room. What do you want now? Came to mock me in person after belittling me, huh? As soon as I stepped into the living room, Kenny, who had been waiting, lashed out at me. Of course, I immediately said I didn't mean to cause any misunderstanding and apologized. But Kenny was as unreceptive as ever. To make matters worse, his parents sided with him. Thinking you're all that just because you both work. Don't you know that's not how a wife should act? That's why we were against marrying someone from such an unreasonable family. They berated me loudly, insisting that I was to blame for hurting their son's pride. And that's all they would talk about. Kenny doesn't want to go back to the apartment you two shared. If you don't want a divorce, move out from there and live here with us. We'll set you straight on how to be a proper wife. I wonder why I didn't just agree to a divorce then and there. But at that time, I still had feelings for Kenny. And having grown up with parents who were essentially estranged, I probably didn't understand what a marriage was supposed to be reflecting naively on my situation. Soon after, I did as Jennifer had demanded and moved out of the apartment to live with my in-laws. They were overly pleased, and I quickly understood why. Turns out, Jennifer and Steve's older son, Ryan, three years Kenny's senior, had been living with them until he moved out a few months before my promotion, saying he wanted to live alone after finding a girlfriend. Jennifer, who had been adoring Ryan, who graduated from a university ranked higher than Kenny's, seems to have been completely shocked by the sudden turn of events. But the problem wasn't just emotional. Ryan's departure meant the loss of financial contributions he had been making to the household. Jennifer and Steve, being proud and ostentatious, loved hosting expensive gatherings with relatives. Of course, Steve's earnings from working under the Ray Employment Program after retirement aren't enough to cover everything and Ryan's contributions had been their financial lifeline. The truth is, they talked Kenny into moving in together after he came home to vent about me. Kenny, feeling inferior to his accomplished older brother, suddenly relished the attention. When I realized this, it was a moment of clarity. But bad things continued. Soon after, Ryan got married to Emily. Turned out, my new sister-in-law Emily was quite the trickster. She was six years his junior, and two years younger than Kenny and me. Emily appeared fragile and delicate, arousing a protective instinct in men, including Steve and Kenny, who became noticeably restless and attentive whenever she visited. Being seduced by his brother's wife, that's because you lack charm. If you'd just show as a grandchild, my husband would settle down as a grandfather. Jennifer, not amused, started blaming me, eventually. She even suggested I quit my job to focus on getting pregnant. However, with the in-laws wasteful spending, the household expenses were skyrocketing. 
and Kenny's salary alone couldn't cover it. Even when I printed out the household budget software to explain, they wouldn't listen. It's all because of your poor management, isn't it? Always full of excuses. They just kept repeating criticisms of me. Then, Emily got pregnant. Suddenly, Jennifer, who had been cool towards Emily, was now in full-on grandbaby fever mode, doting on the newborn Andrew as if she couldn't love him enough. Now, eager to see her grandchild, Jennifer started warmly welcoming Emily's visits, which she had previously avoided. Ah, so adorable. Living under the same roof with such a grandchild would be bliss. Exactly. Emily is young and beautiful, and unlike you. She gave them a grandchild right away. I'm truly envious of my brother. Kenny started throwing these sarcastic comments directly at me. That's right. Maybe we should just kick out a wife who can have kids and live with Ryan's family instead. Steve was just as brazen in his remarks. By this time, even I began to think that since I had no children with Kenny, leaving this house and ending the marriage was one option. Then, Emily's second pregnancy came to light. Jennifer's grandbaby fever became even more intense, and her treatment of me grew increasingly harsh. Isn't it because you're cheating that you can't have kids? Just worried we'll mix up, whether it's Kenny's or your lover's child. Such absurd accusations started flying out of nowhere. I was so appalled I ignored her. But one evening at dinner, I noticed Jennifer smirking at me. Confused, I asked what was going on. You were cheating after all. Just as I suspected. Steve and Kenny asked what she meant. I caught the affair on hidden camera. Hired a pro, so it's all perfect. She announced this triumphantly, bursting into loud laughter. Steve and Kenny were momentarily stunned. If that's true, then it's divorce. Sure thing. Gotta make sure she gets her alimony paid up proper. They said, smirking as much as Jennifer. I told Jennifer clearly. Understood. Then I'll take the opportunity at Andrew's upcoming third birthday celebration next week to explain the situation to all the relatives. The celebration, arranged by the flamboyant Jennifer, turned out to be a lavish event at a rented hotel banquet hall. The relatives, half tired of Jennifer's bragging, seemed to enjoy the food and drinks. As the party neared its end, I took the microphone and stood at the podium. The relatives looked on, wondering what was happening. Excuse me for interrupting your conversation, but I have something brief to report to everyone gathered here today. While the rest of them murmured in confusion, my in-laws and Kenny, thinking I was about to admit fault and discuss divorce, were grinning away just like last time. Ryan's family, who are the guests of honor today, are no different. I signaled to the staff, and a screen was lowered behind me. As the projector was brought in and the lights dimmed, everyone's attention turned to the screen, and a video began to play. The video started with footage of a suspicious-looking hotel street, zooming in on the entrance of one hotel, causing Kenny, Steve, and Emily's faces to pale as expected. But Jennifer, oblivious, looked around, wondering what was about to unfold. In the next moment, as the camera captured a clear image, a collective gasp of what escaped from the relatives. It made sense. The screen unmistakably showed Emily and Steve coming out of the hotel, hugging each other. The room fell silent as the image continued, zooming in on Emily and Steve sharing a prolonged, passionate hub before catching a taxi. Then the scene switched back to the same hotel entrance. But this time it was Kenny, not Steve, walking out hand in hand with Emily. Kenny, Steve, and Emily were frozen, muttering. I knew it. The room erupted again. I paused to play back, turned the lights back on, and began to speak into the microphone. The announcement I have to make is straightforward. As you've just seen, my husband Kenny and Steve have been having affairs with Emily, Ryan's wife. The evidence, as Jennifer had requested, is thoroughly documented by the investigative agency. As I held up a thick file of documents, murmurs filled the room again. 
Waiting for the noise to subside, I revealed that the investigation Jennifer initiated was not to catch Steve, Kenny, and Emily's infidelity, but to find evidence of my supposed cheating and kick me out. Probably fed up with me, Kenny must have filled her with nonsense. I find it odd that she took it seriously. As I said this with a light laugh, the relatives looked at Kenny and Jennifer with disdain. Jennifer, thinking she had proof of my cheating, triumphantly declared victory without checking the contents, but I had no clue about any affair. I then projected a photo on the screen. It was a snapshot taken at the hospital when baby Andrew was born, showing Emily holding Andrew, Ryan smiling beside her and Kenny and I in the background, having come to celebrate, being disliked by Jennifer. I figured she didn't have a single clear photo of me. So, she sent this snapshot to the investigators, asking to catch her daughter-in-law cheating. Glancing at Jennifer, her dumbfounded expression confirmed my guess. However, the agency mistook Emily, holding the baby, as the wife to be investigated and they unexpectedly cart Steve and Kenny repeatedly visiting the hotel with her, thinking Ryan was the husband. The agency reported capturing the evidence on camera to Jennifer. She assumed it was proof of my infidelity. While I was initially surprised by Jennifer's sudden claim of having evidence of my affair, a thought quickly struck me. It was the name of the investigative agency on the family card statement Jennifer used. The spendthrift Jennifer had made me get a family credit card for her use when her own credit limit ran out. She often made large purchases without consulting me, so I set up to check the monthly charges through the app. The next day, I took a half day off to visit the investigative agency I found online to explain the situation, and I formally requested an investigation. Aware of their mistake, they eagerly accepted to make amends and quickly provided the results. With the screen removed and the lights brightened, Emily, Steve, and Kenny sat there, pale-faced. I approached my husband's great uncle and aunt, who commanded the highest respect among the relatives, and pleaded, I'm terribly sorry, but I'd prefer not to discuss what comes next in front of the children, especially Andrew. Could someone please take them to another room? The great uncle and aunt briskly approached Emily, took Andrew, and handed him over to their own children. Seizing the moment, several women led the other children to another room, leaving only the enraged relatives, a stunned Jennifer and Ryan, and a cowering Steve, Kenny, and Emily. Jennifer then leaped towards Emily, shouting, What have you done? Betraying me and Ryan, with my husband and Kenny. She yelled that and immediately went to grab Emily. Some relatives hurriedly intervened, but Emily was already trembling in fear. Steve and Kenny were just as shaken, but I decided to set off the final fireworks against them. Regrettably, given these circumstances, I will be divorcing Kenny. I apologize for the inconvenience caused to everyone. According to the investigation agency, this inappropriate relationship among these three didn't just start yesterday. There's no fixing this marriage anymore. After reviewing the investigation, I couldn't help but think that Andrew, and possibly the child Emily is carrying now, might be Steve's or maybe Kenny's. I found it too painful to consider anything else. I covered my face with a piece of tissue, staggering slightly as if it might be too much. The remaining women in the room rushed over, patting my back and supporting me. What shameless people. Disgusting. How pitiful. The women started berating the three loudly. The men also surrounded them with contemptuous looks. Steve and Kenny turned even paler and remained silent, with only Jennifer's ranting and Emily's sobbing filling the room. The fallout from the fireworks I launched spread quickly. Ryan, upon learning of his father and brother's affairs with his wife, was initially in shock, but soon began to seriously question the paternity fraud I hinted at. It's got to be a lie from that woman. Andrew and the baby in my womb are undoubtedly your kids. Emily pleaded desperately, but once the seed of doubt was sown, it wasn't easily dismissed. Stealing a chance from Emily's reluctance, 
Ryan had a paternity test and using a kit, and the results were affirmative. Despite this, Emily vehemently denied the allegations of paternity fraud, prompting an infuriated Ryan to contact her parents. Emily's parents, shocked by the news, couldn't just take Ryan's word for it and came to my office seeking an explanation. I found it bothersome but considered it a necessary procedure anyway. The next day, I took off work to meet with Emily's parents, along with Emily and Ryan, at the law firm I had hired. After the lawyer showed them the related documents and the video, Emily's parents were speechless. See, I told her, she's been cheating on me with my brother and even my father. Not just Andrew, but the unborn child surely isn't mine either. It's best if you discuss these matters among yourselves. We're not here to find out who the father of the baby is, but to discuss suing your wife for damages as Kenny's mistress. The lawyer interjected sharply, surprising Ryan, who was boasting proudly for some reason. Of course, it's only natural. Why the heck does my hired lawyer have to be on Ryan's side? It just doesn't make sense. But more stunned were Emily and her parents. I won't pay any damages. After all, Kenny's affair with me was because you were a charmless wife, too caught up in your work. So, you're to blame. Emily retorted to me scornfully. Is that so? Then we might have to let a third party decide, perhaps a judge. As I said this, Emily's parents went pale. No wonder, both of Emily's parents are teachers at a prestigious local girls' high school. It seems that at that school, they boast about fostering good wives and mothers. The scandal of Emily, as a daughter of the teachers at a prestigious girls' high school, being involved in a messy affair with her brother-in-law and father-in-law, and facing a lawsuit for damages for adultery, could very well tarnish their reputation. Upon hearing lawsuit, Emily's parents quickly pleaded deeply, pulling Emily down from the sofa to the floor. We are terribly sorry. Regarding the alimony, if you could claim it from your end, I'll make sure to pay the full amount to my daughter right away. But for me, an apology at this point was irrelevant. No matter who it came from, I nodded to my lawyer and left the room. Later, the lawyer informed me that Ryan, Emily, and her parents continued to cause a scene after I left. The lawyer threatened to call the police unless they left immediately, and they finally left. Afterward, perhaps as hush money, Emily's parents quickly transferred nearly double the damages I had claimed through the lawyer. Regardless of what happened to Ryan and Emily, it didn't concern me anymore, but I learned about the in-laws' downfall from Kenny, who had also be filed for damages and property division. According to Kenny, Ryan demanded a divorce and damages for adultery from Emily. Furthermore, Ryan refused to pay child support for Andrew and stated he would not pay any for the unborn child unless DNA tests proved he was the father, declaring he would file for denial of paternity as soon as the child was born, despite everything settling down on my end. Emily's parents, terrified, forced her to undergo prenatal testing. Turns out, the baby's father was not Ryan but Kenny, and to make matters worse, Andrew's father was Steve. Upon learning this, Jennifer was devastated to find out her beloved grandson Andrew was actually Steve's child, leading to her mental breakdown. She rapidly aged and is now almost bedridden, with Steve providing constant care. However, Ryan claimed damages from Steve and Kenny for causing the breakdown of his marriage. If you can't pay the damages, I'm willing to offset it against your inheritance. But in that case, I won't take care of you in your old age. Let Kenny handle everything. Ryan reportedly told Steve, however, Steve, who had secretly spent most of his retirement funds on luxury items and jewelry to impress Emily, was left with almost nothing. As a result, facing offset with the inheritance, the in-laws, now disowned by Ryan, desperately clung to Kenny, but Kenny himself, facing claims from me and also being pressured by Emily, who was divorced by Ryan, was told to take full responsibility for her and the unborn child, pushing for a reunion with him. 
I'm sorry for everything. Please, let's start over. I love you. He begged me like that, but it was clear that what he wanted wasn't my love, but a wife who would bring money and serve his parents for free. With no lingering feelings for Kenny, I instructed through my lawyer to finalize everything and blocked all contact except for one social media account. After some time, the divorce was finalized. Despite some disputes, the alimony and property division payments were made in two installments. My lawyer mentioned that Emily continued to stay in the in-law's house, pretending to be Kenny's wife, even though they weren't legally married. But the relatives who visited that day spread the word, leading to whispers in the neighborhood about the shameless family, forcing Emily to become a recluse. She neither helped with Jennifer's care nor looked after Andrew or the newborn, resulting in a report from the kindergarten concerned about Andrew's unkempt appearance to child services. Eventually, Emily's parents took custody of the two children, stating, Emily is no longer our daughter or their parent. Never show your face to us again. With nowhere to turn, Emily became completely dependent on Kenny, just like her and Laura's. It seems like Kenny's the sole breadwinner now, supporting four adults including his mother who needs care. Tough situation. According to a colleague at the same company as Kenny, one relative who worked for an affiliated company spread an exaggerated story, making Kenny the target of ridicule on gossip websites. Despite the tough situation, he couldn't quit his job and continued working under strained conditions. Meanwhile, Ryan seemed to view me as a fellow victim for some reason. However, there's no denying that he, along with Emily and her parents, Look down on me for not being able to have children. Naturally, I ignored him at work. But when rumors spread within our company too, Ryan couldn't bear the whispers and transferred to a subsidiary in the countryside. Later, when everything settled down for me, I was approached for a transfer to an overseas branch. Yeah, I mean, I always kinda hope to make it big overseas since my interview, but gotta admit, this whole thing took me by surprise. However, my superiors encouraged me, acknowledging the career I had steadily built since joining the company and my language skills developed in my spare time. Moreover, I was growing tired of being the subject of office gossip like Ryan, despite their sympathy. So I boldly accepted the job offer and decided to relocate. Kenny, hearing about my transfer, sent a barrage of cliched reconciliation pleas through the only unblocked social media channel, but I planned to leave it all behind when I moved abroad, including cancelling my phone, despite everything that happened. Cutting ties with that family turned out to be a stroke of good fortune. With that in mind, I feel ready to face any challenges ahead. I gotta admit, it may sound blunt, but hey. That's just how I feel. I've been too submissive all this time. From now on, I intend to approach everything with a positive attitude and do my best.